today we're part of the Smith family and uh, thank God for breathing our bodies and clothing on our backs and uh, thank you for just being here.
know he is. Come on, wave at somebody. And say he's blessing me. Yeah. Come on, you want to glorify him, glorify him, glorify him, lift him. Oh, Lord God, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your righteous name, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 We thought it was nice. It'd be nice. Hallelujah. Keep up with the tributes. Late Bishop Branch Allen. We're gonna sing a couple of his best songs. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We know we can't sing like it. Like the voice was unique. Hallelujah. But we're gonna bless God with his words that he left as a legacy. Amen. Amen. Oh, how I love that name. Oh, how I love the name, Jesus. Oh, 
was a miracle worker back yes, then. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody say he's still working miracles. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They still working miracles.
out in here. Jesus, ah, for working miracles. Hallelujah. Good morning. I have one announcement for you. On November the 29th, we will have our fifth Sunday seed sowing service at 9 o'clock. Dinner to go will be served. And now, our thought for the day. Prayer is the key to heaven. But faith unlocks the doors. And now, a triumphant message from our pastor. Amen. Come on, bless the Lord in this place. Amen. Come on, you can do better than that. I didn't say bless me. I said bless the Lord. Come on, if you don't mind, stand to your feet. Give God 30 seconds of your blaze. Come on, 30 seconds of your best praise. Come on. Come on, come on, saints. 30 seconds of your best praise. understand you just said he's a miracle worker amen hallelujah now I'm not trying to be contentious nor am I trying to cause an influx of arguments among those who are watching by the airwaves who may hear this message later on but he is a miracle worker we have a new president elect come on God Amen. Hallelujah. We serve a miracle working God. He answers prayers. Amen, somebody. Even when you don't think he's listening, God hears the prayers of the saints. And he answers our prayers with miracles and wonders performing behind them. Hallelujah. But I am just elated. I'm grateful. Amen. I, I, all I could say when I was at my house, we're at the door trying to tear it down. Let us in. And now he has let us in. Amen, somebody. Amen. We, we serve a mighty God, and I am grateful to be a part of the winning team, and that's God's team, not man's team. Don't misappropriate my conversation. I'm a part of the winning team, and that's God's team. Amen. God always wins. Let me say that again. God always wins. God never loses. Even when things are not going the way we want them, God still is winning. Because the Bible declares emphatically that everything is working for our good. To them that love the Lord and to those that are called according to his purpose. So God is winning all the time. We just don't com comprehend what he's doing while he's doing it. But at the end of the day, he's already won because he's that type of God. Amen. So I'm grateful this morning to be here as we're, we're on the verge of the close of another year. we got one more month left. This is the next to the last second Sunday of this 2020 year. And sisters and brothers, I know it's been tough and it's been tedious. But through it all, God has been good and God has brought us this far. 
But we got so much to be thankful for. I think that was Sister Phil's song early before I came into the sanctuary that we got so much to thank God for. Amen. E even in the midst of all that's going on, the pandemic and all of the racial tension and violence and all of what has happened and has occurred, at the end of the day, if you trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding, God has a way of making things go your way. Hallelujah. And I'm just excited this morning to be here in your presence. We now want to turn your attention now as we prepare to go before the Lord. We want to uh, draw our wandering minds home from the place of the world and the cares of the world and come into this place as we prepare to come before God in this setting of this, sanct uh, this, this sacred setting that he has established. But more important that we observe as Christians born of the house of faith. Jesus has emphatically established this, but God instituted it back in the Old Testament when Israel was under the hard task of Pharaoh and the Egyptians. The Bible declares that God wanted them to know that he keeps his promise. He told Abraham that they would go down in bondage for 400 years. But at the end of that time, he will come and see about his people. My sister and brother, I don't know about you, but God has come to see about us. And we are here because God has come. And he has come with blazing guns, not only to see about us, but to take care of us. And I don't know about you, but as we are in this place this morning, we are in a perfect place as we are here to serve God. But more important, we are here to offer our hearts up to the Lord. The Bible declares that on that night when Jesus sent two of his disciples into uh, the city, he told them that there they would find a man bearing a pitcher of water, that they were instructed to go up to the man and say to the man that God, Jesus Christ, the anointed one, had use of his large upper room. It is important, it's imperative that you correlate the two, the large upper room to heaven because it is a symbol of heaven because heaven is large enough to hold everybody that's a part of the kingdom. But when they got there, the Bible declared that just as Christ instructed them, they found everything in place. And he says to them that when you get there and the man takes you into the house, prepare the house that you and I may dare come and commune together and eat not the Last Supper, but the Lord's Supper. My sisters and brother, I want you to understand that God is preparing the kingdom of heaven, but yet it's already prepared. Even though Jesus said, I'm going away to prepare a place for you, that there, where I am, there you may be also. He's not preparing anything. It's already done. It's already prepared. He's just waiting on us to get ready to go home with him. It's for a prepared people because the place is prepared for those who are preparing themselves to get to the prepared place. And I want you to understand that as we come this morning, we're coming into a setting to honor God's word, to honor God's will, and honor God's uh, uh, statement to us, which is his uh, uh, representation and acknowledgement and observation of his holy communion that Jesus instituted in a large upper room. And he says to the disciples, I will not eat this with you again until that great day when we are gathered around the table in the kingdom of heaven. I'm glad that Jesus spoke those words because it tells me emphatically that we're going to have an opportunity to feast on how we made it over. Oh, come on, saints. Listen to me. We have celebrations on this earth. We throw picnics and we throw celebrations. We throw parties and we do all this stuff. But there ain't nothing like a Holy Ghost party when we get to heaven. All of these parties that we're throwing down here don't even compare to the party we're going to have in heaven when we get there. And they're going to ask the question how we made it over. And we're going to shout that how we made it over. We washed our robes in the blood of the Lamb. And we are here because of his grace and because of his mercy. So I'm thankful this morning. I'm excited about what God is doing and how he's moving in this time. Listen, COVID-19 can't stop God. Are you listening to me? Racial tension can't stop God. Listen to me. And even with the president that is presently said in number 45, he can't stop the work of God. What God intended to take place, 
it shall come to pass. Hallelujah, somebody. Amen, amen, amen. So with that being said, let us go before the Lord in prayer. We just thank you this day, O oh God, for this opportunity that we celebrate you, your goodness, and your mercy. We don't apologize for celebrating who you are, nor do we give any reason why we should not celebrate you. We are here because of your grace and your mercy. Your Bible declares that your mercy is renewed every morning. That God, you didn't have to allow us to see this day. But because of your mercy that watched over us all night long, you gave angels charge over that we wouldn't dash our feet against the stone. And here we are to celebrate on this second Sunday of November to tell you thank you for watching over us. Thank you for clothing us in our right frame of mind. Thank you for giving us a spirit of worship in our hearts this morning. Thank you for allowing your son to shed his precious blood out on Calvary's hill. And yet, oh God, it didn't stop there. He went into the grave for three days and three nights. But early one Sunday morning, the rocks began to shake. A rambling was going on under the underneath. And out of nowhere, a rock came out of a rock. The rock stood up on the rock. And he declared on that rock that he is the rock of all rocks. Thank you, O oh God, for allowing your son to be that rock that was hewn out of the side of the mountain that went rolling down through the city and that no one had the power or authority to stop who he is and what he's doing. So we celebrate you this morning, God. As we come before you on this second Sunday, and as we celebrate this time of communion, we pray that you bless now what we're about to do and what we're about to commune and how we are coming together as one body in Christ because we're united under the blood. And we thank you in advance. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah. Come on, bless the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. We thank God this morning because we do honor and respect the laws that are given to us by our government. Not that we're bound so much spiritually by them, but we want to protect the service of those who are part of this setting. We pray that in this process, that as we go through this time together, uh, that you would understand the magnitude of what has taken place. Sisters and brothers, Jesus is not dead. Listen to him. He's no longer on the cross. The cross is over with. He's moved beyond the cross. And I know we wear the cross as a symbol of him dying on the cross. But don't tie your faith to that symbol of that cross. Because he's sitting on the right hand of the Father. And he's making intercession on our behalf. So no longer are we to look to the cross. When the Bible tells us to look to the hill, he's talking to us looking to heaven and not to the cross. And I'm glad today that our faith is not in the cross, but we're thankful for the cross, but is now in the kingdom where God the Son, God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit reside as one, and they have authority over everything, even in this world. So we come now in honor of this as we remind ourselves the importance of honoring God's word as we stand, as we come collectively around this place, as the choir comes from my right to my left, following them, we ask that everyone else will proceed from my right to my left as we offer to you this holy sacrament of God's body, God's blood, because it serves as a symbol. It is not the direct emblem, or it is not the direct thing that occurred, but it's an emblem of what he has done in Jesus' name. So as the choir now comes from the choir loft from my right to my left, we honor God now through this sacred moment. And for those who are watching by television and airways, we say to you, you can join us. You can join us by looking in your house for crackers and wine or grape juice and participate with us in this setting in Jesus name.
body of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus. The blood that was shed on Calvary's Hill for the remission of sins. As often as we do this, we do this in acknowledgement of who he is and what he has done for us. We are grateful this morning for the Lord's pr precious love and his precious anointing that he himself gives us. This is body and this is blood of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus. We are grateful this morning that as we come into your presence that God is getting the honor, God is getting the glory, and God is getting all of the praise because it's never about us but it's always about him and to this end we bless his name we thank him for this time together body and blood of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus as often the scripture says we do this we do this in remembrance of who he is we are grateful today that he looked beyond all of our faults and he didn't just see our needs but he met the need that was on the table so we're thankful this morning to be here in your presence oh God to be able to offer a sacrifice of love and praise unto you we're grateful this morning to be a part of this oh God bless now guide us and keep us now that in everything we give him honor we give him glory body and blood of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus and as often as we do this we do this in remembrance of him we thank the Lord this morning for who he is and what he's already done for us hallelujah thank you Lord the Bible say bless the Lord oh my soul and all that is within me bless his holy name hallelujah we come now when we ask that as we come together now in preparation of communion that we take the bread together that we may commune together let's eat and likewise on that same night they took the wine and drank. Let us drink together also. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for being the God of our soul. Hallelujah. We bless you today. We thank you today, O oh God. We give you praise. We give you honor. And we give you all of the glory. Thank you, O oh God. We love you. We bless you. We thank you. For all that you have done and that you're doing, we give you praise today. Yes, Lord, when we're down, yes, Lord, always protecting us. Yes, Lord, when we're lost, yeah, yeah, always leading us and guiding us. Yes. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Come on, sing that. Come on, sing it. Listen, open your hearts and receive the message that's been sung by the choir. Listen to the words. Let the words enter into your hearts now. Listen to the words. They're giving you power. It gives you strength. It's giving you what you need to face life. If you would just open your hearts and receive what they're saying this morning. 
Listen to the words, powerful words, strong words, authentic words, words that gives you the ability to run a little further, words that gives you the opportunity to know that God is still on the throne. Yeah. Yes, Lord. Yeah, Holy One. He's the one. Yeah, He's the one. The one and only. He's our only one, I tell you. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He see that a little bush. Here a little bush. He said a little bush. Here 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 a little bush. In the name of Jesus, we celebrate you in this place, oh God. Hallelujah, God. Thank you. Hallelujah. Yeah. You are my protection. Thank you. When I'm lost. Woo. When I'm don't when I'm lost, God, don't know which way to go. You are my darling. Yeah. I'll never forget. I won't, God, I won't, I won't. Oh, I would never forget. Hallelujah. Now put your hands together right there. Come on, give him your best now. Come on. Come on, come on, come on. Lift your voices. Come on, tell the Lord thank you. Come on, say hallelujah in this place. Come on, lift your voices. Hallelujah. Come on, put your hands together. Come on. Thank you. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, bless our music ministry this morning. Hallelujah. He deserves the honor. He deserves all the glory and all of the praise. Thank you, Lord God. We bless the Lord in this place this morning. We give him honor, we give him glory, and we give him all of the praise. Hallelujah. Amen. Again, we welcome those who are listening and watching by the airways of Facebook, and those who will be watching this via YouTube, we are grateful this morning to be with you, to share the word of God, because it is his will. Hallelujah, somebody. And I want to, this morning, just be as candid and with revelation, and hope that this is new revelation to some of you uh, about God's word as never seen before, because it is powerful when you have a great understanding of God's word. If you will turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 9, I want to look at verse 15, 16, 17, and 18. As the Holy Spirit has guided me and has led me to this place as we continue to focus on prayer, but understanding it from a different perspective. We, we, we've been building on this subject area or subject point on prayer because, listen, the evidence of our praying is relevant for our day. What we are experiencing are the fruit of our prayer. I said about two weeks ago that you and I are here not because of our prayers, but we're here because of our foreparents' prayer. 
And that prayer goes all the way into eternity. And it revolves and exists even in eternity. And some of you say, well, that's not possible. Well, I would differ with you and say that it is possible and it is true. Uh, the scripture says that Jesus di directly, emphatically made a statement. He says, uh, the enemy desired to sift you as wheat. But in the next phase or the next clause of his breath, he said, but I've already prayed for you. Now, let me help you understand this now. Jesus didn't wait to get to the earth to pray for you. He prayed in heaven before he got in. He just manifested what he had already prayed for, and he went on back to heaven. And now he's just allowing it to roll on even now. So what occurred happened in heaven. God didn't need to wait to get to heaven to perform his work. No, he did it in heaven, but he performed it on the earth. So again, we're here because of our foreparents praying for us. And I need you to understand this morning that as we're looking at this particular text, I want you to capture the essence of what's been stated here in this text. Uh, in Hebrews 9, verse 15 through 18. And I would le be led by the Spirit this morning and let him direct me how he wants me to go because I don't want to get out there on a limb on my own, but I want to be led by the Spirit of the Lord. Hebrews 9, 15 through 18 says this, and I'm reading it to you from the NIV version. It says, For this reason Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it. Because a will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. I want to talk about this morning praying the Father's will. Praying the Father's will. And my sisters and brothers, I need you to walk with me to understand what am I saying about praying the Father's will. We often hear this terminology in the church, and we loosely use it with not really understanding it. Because it speaks to the essence of us not gaining the revelation because we don't pray his will. And when we don't pray his will, it speaks to the fact that we have rejected his will. Uh, it's in the Bible. I'm going to show it to you in just a moment. It's in the Bible. The Bible says it. I didn't know that, but I found out through studying, through spending time alone. The reason why we don't pray the will is because we reject what God wants to do in our lives because we operate in the mindset of carnality. And when you are carnal in mind, you have the mindset that you can do it by yourself. And it's only when you are stuck in a place when you realize that you need God, that you try to run and turn to him. And what I want you to capture this morning in praying the Father's will, in order for you to pray the Father's will, you need to know what his will is. Ah, oh, come on, saints, walk with me this morning. Listen, oftentimes we are called and compelled to pray the will of the Father, and not know what his will really is. The principal understanding of this reality is based upon one word, knowing. Knowing is knowledge, and knowledge leads to understanding. And when you don't understand, you are lost. That's why the scripture points to rejection 
as the principal reason for not knowing. Some would say, well, where does it state that I'm glad you asked me? Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 says this. He says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because they have rejected knowledge. Listen to this. He didn't say that you are destroyed for lack of knowledge because of ignorance. He said you are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you are rejecting it. Which simply means that you don't want it, you still want to do it your way. And he goes on to say, I will also reject them, or thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Sin thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. In other words, it just doesn't affect you. It affects your generation to come. So in other words, adults, young adults, those who have children, when you're rejecting God, God is not only going to reject you, but he's going to reject your loins that's going to come out of you. And it's only until you repent and get yourself in line that God will change his mind. Do I have a witness in this place this morning? Listen, to know the will of God opens the avenue for prayer because it builds a relationship between the two parties which promotes knowing and understanding. Yes, to gain knowledge necessary for revelatory understanding meant God had to reveal the importance of its meaning. But it had not been revealed by him yet in the old covenant. It wasn't revealed until the new covenant had been established. And you can find it in verse 8 of this ninth chapter. And what I'm trying to get you to understand this morning is this, church, saints, sisters and brothers, and those who are listening by airwaves. A will is put in place by an individual who's trying to get you something. Y'all didn't receive it on that side. Let me go over to this side. A will is designed to provide you with something that you presently don't have. Okay, seems like nobody on that side got it. What I'm trying to get you to understand is this is that the will is already prepared and all that they want you to do is line up so you can receive what they're trying to give you. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. See, see, I, my will for my children are already in operation. When my wife and I die, they don't have to fuss and fight. They don't have to argue what daddy and mom and left and how much they gave us because at the end of the day, the will is in place. So if I die, they already know because I shed it in blood. Somebody got to walk with me this morning. Oh, Lord. So when we're talking about praying the will, what I'm trying to get you to understand is that the will has to be read because it was already set in place, but it was set in place by blood and someone has to come along and give you the instruction so you have a revelation of what it is that's coming to you, but when you reject it, then you get nothing. Oh yeah, some folks fight back, but, uh, like that anyway. Mama didn't leave me this and daddy didn't leave me that. So I don't want none of it. Well, that's on you. Yeah. It ain't about you getting what you want. It's about you getting what's been left for you to have. Oh, Lord, help me, Holy Spirit. I I'm trying to get you to understand the will. Why we need to pray his will. And why we're not praying his will. Because we have rejected his will. And when we have rejected his will, then we're missing out on our inheritance. And since we're missing out on our inheritance, then we have to walk through life lost. And when we're walking through life lost, then we're like sheep with no shepherd. 
And when we have no shepherd, then anything will do. And when anything will do, it will lead you down a wide path and you will run into all kinds of problems. That's why the scripture talks about the two roads. The wide road where you see travelers all the time is because they don't understand the will. But when you're on the narrow road, you have made a decision to pull yourself from off the wide road and to get on the narrow road and walk in the will of God and receive what he's trying to give you and he protects you from all harm. Do I have a witness in this place today? Yeah. Listen to me. Listen to me. Uh, now there is the question of the will and why we must pray the will. As Christ stated in the model prayer, let thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Let, let, let me say that again. Let thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Uh, my sisters and brothers, let me say to you that when we are being spoken about and spoken to from this particular subject, that God through Christ is saying, I want my will to be done, but it can't be done if my people don't receive it. And when you don't receive it, it speaks profoundly to your salvation. Yeah, because see, if my children reject what I'm leaving them, it profoundly speaks about their heart towards me. Oh, Lord, help me, Holy Ghost. Listen to me. If Monique, Dominique, and Jawan and Carson, and, and, and Des, they go to fighting along with Caleb, they fight about what we left for them, they get to arguing about it, it speaks volume about how much they respect mama and daddy. And the reason why we are walking around in the church the way we are, not understanding God's will, because it speaks volumes about how much you think about God. Oh, yes, it do. You give your soul to the world, but you give God only what's left over. Ain't nobody saying nothing but the preacher, but it's okay. And then when you're out there in the world and the world is beating you up and beating you down and you're trying to figure out how to get out of it, you're trying to figure out how to come out of what you're in, it's only then when you run to God. But as soon as he's sure your foundation up, you're gone back into the world. Ain't nobody saying nothing but the preacher. Let your will be done as it is in heaven. I can't pray the will if I don't know the will. And when I don't know the will, it's because I reject the will. And since I reject the will, it speaks volumes about how much I love him. And when I don't love him, I'm going to do it my way. And when you want to do it your way, then the Bible said that he'll give you over to a reprobated mind. He'll let you work the way you want to work. Do it the way you want to do it. Operate the way you want to operate until you come back to your mind and get your foundation in order, which is your house. God wants to speak to you and he wants to get you to a place of understanding of how you are to live in this world and he did it through the will. Help me Holy Ghost speak in this place today. Listen, believers must know the importance and value of praying the master's will because the will is the written word of God in Logos form. Yes, it is. That's why he gave you the Bible. So if your head couldn't remember it, you can go to the Bible and read it with your eyes. <laughs> Help me, Holy Spirit. That's why he gave it to you. Some of you pick it up when you want to and put it down on the other times. Oh, come on, say amen, church. I know I'm not talking to the lights. I'm talking to live beings in this place today. And what I'm trying to get you to capture is this. His will contains the heart of who he is. 
and why he thinks and operates the way he does. When your mother and your father leaves you a will, it speaks about how they feel, how they're thinking about you when they leave you what they want you to have. It means that they're looking beyond themselves and they're trying to make sure they fulfill the destiny of God through the generation of what's to come because the father must leave wealth for generations to come. And it speaks about that God wanted to give us something greater than what we presently have because he was looking into our destiny. So I can't pray something that I don't know what it is I'm praying for. Mm-hmm. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm going to say anything. And anything just won't work. You got to know how to pray when you're praying. And you got to know what you're praying about when you're praying. And you got to know who you're praying to when you're praying. <laughs> listen. Listen. You can't pray something that you don't know or understand because it's foolishness to you and to those who don't know to do it why because it speaks again to your rejected knowledge some will say well what's the will pastor well you want me to really show it to you let me show it to you 69, 66 books bound in one book to give you the knowledge of the God that you serve to tell you how he formed this world and how he's going to call it into order to speak about how he's going to save us and where he's going to save us from to show us that even in the very beginning when Jesus had never showed up on the scene he pointed to him coming one day that he was going to die for you and I give his life as a ransom for our sin. He paid the ultimate price for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. He gave you a book, no matter if it's hardcover, no matter if it's paperback, no matter if it's leather bound, he left it here for you to read it, to get a revelation, to get an understanding, to let you know what his will is, and if you never pick it up, how you gonna know what to do? Yeah, because some of us depend on the preacher to tell us everything. Well, how do you know I ain't lying? Huh? How do you know I'm not telling you the truth? Huh? See, when you read this ninth chapter and you bag up a few verses in it, it speaks to the same sentiments about the priest and the high priest. It shares with you and I that they will go in and offer prayer to God on the people's behalf. And the high priest will go in one time a year and sprinkle blood upon everything in the sanctuary or in the tabernacle. And he will offer prayer on behalf of not only them, but also for himself once a year. Why? Because it symbolizes that even he needed praying for. It symbolizes that even he needed to be covered. It symbolizes that even he had sin. It symbolizes that he was just as much human as those that he was praying for. And what I'm trying to get you to understand, you need to know God for yourself. Yeah. That's why the veil in the temple was torn into twain. To send the clear message that we don't need man to pray for us no more. We don't need a revelatory person standing in between us and God. Because Christ Jesus is that mediator. He is the one. The one that's our paraclete. That's praying on our behalf. He's standing between the Father and you and I. Oh, yes, he is. See, it symbolizes how Moses stood between God and the nation of Israel. 
how Moses was the one that always prayed for Israel. He was the one that always kept God from destroying Israel. He was the one that always reminded God of what he said he was going to do for them. He had to stand there as the mediator to protect the nation. Don't you know Jesus? The reason why this world hasn't been called to order is because of Jesus. Don't you understand why we are not destroyed? It's because of Jesus. Don't you understand? You haven't lost your mind. It's because of Jesus. Don't you understand? The reason why you hadn't lost everything is because of Jesus. It ain't because of you been so good. You better get your head out. Okay. Uh-huh. Excuse me. But I don't apologize. I just respect my young folks in the house. See, we like to lie more than the truth. We like to hear stuff that tickle our ears and tickle our fantasies. We don't like the truth, and the Bible says it's the truth that sets you free. The lie keeps you in bondage, but the truth frees you. That's why they call Jesus the truth. Why? Because he set us free. Oh, Lord, help me. Thank you, Lord. Listen, as we exegete this text a little further, listen. The author penned the text, and it's necessary to understand what is being presented. Praying God's will must be resolute and understandable. Why? Number one, because we've already shared with you that no will is enforced until the testator is dead. Number two, the glory of the will can never be revealed until the death of the testator. And number three, the shedding of blood validates the will and not the law. Can I say to you that your will until you die is no good? Because your blood hasn't been shed? Can I say to you until your blood is shed that your will is null and void? And it has no value? Well, why would you say that? Because the person that the will is you assigned it to can't get it until you're dead, until your blood is shed. How much more is the glory of God through the blood of Jesus? Oh, Lord, help me, Holy Ghost. How much more validation of Jesus' blood in him dying on, for, on the cross for you and I validate that now he's sitting on the right hand of the Father that the will has that much more powerful. But more important, it gives us our inheritance. Allah, I want mine. I don't know about you. Every morning I get up, I thank him for his mercy. But then I say, God, let your will be done in me today as it is in heaven. I want you to manifest my inheritance through your will in my life. I don't want to leave here and get to heaven. And God showed me all the things he was trying to give me. But because I rejected him, I missed an opportunity to receive more than what I have because I failed to line my life up. I failed to operate in faith. I failed to operate through prayer. I failed to give him glory. I failed to give him praise. I failed to call his name name out. I failed to do his will. I failed to not operate the way he wanted to. And then I'm going to sit there and say, are you saying I could have had all of this? And he's going to respond, yeah, you could have had all this. And we're sitting here fighting. Our children killing one another for land and foolishness. Just lost another because of sister stuff that don't make any sense and we're sitting down on our laws as if it's okay because nobody's teaching God's will anymore we're trying to get it all and don't understand that it's no good without God 
And somebody got to stand up. It ain't just the preacher's job. It's the community's job also. When is enough is enough. Jesus already done died. So we can have this freedom. So we can have our rights. But more important, so we can receive our inheritance. And we're still sitting around waiting. Listen, when it comes to the old covenant versus the new covenant, the old was ratified. Well, what do you mean by ratified? It means to confirm by expressing consent, approval, or formal sanction by an agent or a representative. And that person was Moses. Moses was the one that ratified because he wanted the people to understand the will of God. Not that the old covenant had power to save, but it showed the people what God was trying to give them and how he wanted them to live so they can receive their inheritance, not when they get to heaven, but while they were here on earth. And I'm saying to the church of the modern age, if God is trying to give us something now, why are we not accessing the will? So let me say this to you. That little that you got right now, it don't mean nothing to God. You got $100,000 in the bank, so what? God got millions and billions in the kingdom. And he's trying to give you more. You got a new car, so what? God got rolls and bins and Lamborghinis and cars you don't know nothing about rolling out of the pavement of heaven. And he wants to give it to us. But we can't access it because we don't know his will. That's why Paul said, I'm forgetting those things that are behind me. What do you mean? I've gained the knowledge of what he can and will do for me, so I got to look into the future for greater things to come my way. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Read it for yourself. Read Romans 5 and understand what he's saying. Paul is writing to you and I. Read it, verse 1 through 5. Talks about you gain experience, experience hope, and hope make it not a shame because the love of God is shared abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. What he's trying to get you to understand is that the glory of God is in us. The presence of God is upon us. And what God has done in the past, he can do even greater in the future. And all we got to do is understand and pray his will. So God said the old covenant was ratified. And the representative was sanctioned or it was given by God through the representative known as Moses. He ratified it by offering sacrifices, listen to this, and taking the blood of the animals and sprinkling it upon the people and on everything in the temple. Might I suggest to you uh, that the blood has been sprinkled in the kingdom. Might I suggest to you that the blood is the most powerful agent in the world and that the blood has the power to reach from eternity down into hell and reach all the way back up to eternity. It has that power. Listen, this points to a new and better way of coming from God. Uh, the new covenant fulfilled the old covenant and sealed everything with Christ, shed in his most precious blood. Uh, this was a once and for all sacrifice to be offered no more. His death and resurrection forged a new and better way. So we must know the way in order to pray that it be done. I wonder who I have a witness in this place. When I get to these few verses, God allowed the author, the representative, to place the handwriting of God's heart on the pages that we may get a revelation 
of the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. For us to understand that the old covenant was ratified. But when Jesus came along, it was clarified and solidified. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord, he paid the price through his precious blood. And he left it here for you and I. The disciples were the ones that were the representat representat representations of God's will and word. They wrote down the gospel message. They put it on the pages to remind us of what Jesus said and what he's done. And all I'm trying to get you to understand that if you don't know what the pages say, you're in contention with God and you have rejected knowledge. The Bible wants us to understand this most solemn thing, that, our, that his word must be hid in our hearts, that we don't sin against our God. I'm not talking about you memorizing the verse like children do, but I'm talking about you hiding it in your heart, that when the enemy comes in like a flood, God is able to raise up a standard. And not only will you turn and fight against him, but you will declare, as Jesus said, in the garden. When he stood up in the garden, when he was there in the wilderness, and every time the enemy came in like a flood, Jesus turned around and told him what the word of God said. And all I'm trying to get you to understand, if you don't know what the will is, if you don't know what the will says, you can't defend yourself, and nor can you pray. God is trying to get us to our place where we can walk in our favor. And not is our favor, but it's his favor that he's given to you and I. Listen to me. The Bible declares in verse 15 what it says to you and I. And it talks about that God wanted us to receive our promised eternal inheritance. A will contain the knowledge and the information regarding what God wants to give to you and I. My sisters and brother, can I tell you that the Bible says you got healing. The Bible said that you got love. The Bible said that you got, most importantly, the love of God in your heart. And that the anointing of God is upon your life. That is have the ability to destroy everything. What the enemy meant for bad, God turns around and uses it for your good. The power of God is upon you, and you need to understand who you are. And when you don't understand who you are, then you will let the enemy destroy you. And I want you to understand that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. You need to know the word of God. You need to hide it in your heart so you would know what your inheritance is. So when the enemy comes in trying to tell you that this doesn't belong to you, you can turn and tell him like Jesus said, Get thee behind me, say, God said it, I believe it, and that's enough. Whatever God said in his will, I'm going to pray it to come to pass. And I will have what the word said. And the reason why we don't have is because we don't ask what it is that God wants to give us. And I'm saying to you that the Bible declares you have not because you ask not. And the reason why you're not asking, because you don't know what to ask for. And all I'm trying to get you to understand that if you want your inheritance to come forth, you need to start studying God's word. You need to start praying God's word. You need to start meditating on God's word. So when the enemy attacks you, you can tell them what God's word has already told you. That power is in your hand. That power is in your life. That power is upon you. That the glory of God is in your life. That you're not just any old thing. You are a new creature. Old things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. That the word of God is your sufficiency. That the power of God is your dunamis strength. That God has raised you up for such a time as this. That you can walk under the anointing that you can show the enemy that God is using you. I don't care what the world may say, but God has anointed you. God has given you everything you need. God has walked into your life. God has made a new way for you. God has done everything for you. And all you got to do is pray his will. And surely, I say surely, surely, goodness and mercy shall follow you.
you all the days of your life and you will dwell in the house of the Lord. Good morning, triumphant. May he bless you. May he keep you. May he guide you. May he lead you. And may you know his will for your whole life that when he calls your name, you will be able to answer for yourself. God is good, but he's better than good. And should I, he will take care of you. Hang on in there. No matter what it looks like, God got you covered. Yeah. yeah. He's good. I tell you, God is good. He's better than good. Listen, I challenge you that as you leave out of this year, set a new standard for your own life. Put it upon your heart that you're going to try to read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation so you can hide it in your heart and you won't be taken by the enemy. Don't depend on your pastor preacher to preach every word to you. The Holy Spirit can do better than I can. And when you trust in the word with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding, he promised a guarantee, a prophetic word. He promised that goodness and mercy shall be with you always, even to the end of the age. Hang on in there with God. And no matter what comes your way, get on your knees and pray. Don't just pray your crying. Pray his will. Hide it in your heart. Get it deep down in you. So you don't necessarily have to depend on a man to get you through. Oh, it's good to send someone else to pray and lift your prayers up. But you need to learn how to pray for yourself. Because one day I won't be able to get to you. I won't be able to pray myself. But when you sin up the temple, as the old folk would say, it prepares you for that day. And you'll be able to make it even in the midst of what's going on because of the God that we serve. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. To God be the glory. May he keep you, may he protect you, and may he guide you from this time forward. In Jesus' name, give the Lord a round of applause. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We thank those for listening by airways. May God's word reach you. May the anointing come upon you. And may you know his will, that you will pray his will in the times of need and even when you don't know him. Pray the will of God by knowing what his will is, and God will take care of you. God bless until we meet again. Have a great day and a great week. Amen.